This video is brought to you by NVIDIA and the new MSI GE76 30 series laptop, which I got to check out when I was playing Deathloop. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about how NVIDIA and MSI's next gen hardware can transform the way you play. All right, let me ask you something. Do you remember Prey Moon Crash? No, you don't. No one does. It was a standalone DLC released 12 months after Prey's initial release. It had absolutely zero marketing dollars behind it. No one knew it existed. No one covered it. Metacritic has like 16 reviews for it. None of them are from a major outlet except for PC Gamer. There are a total of 1,200 reviews for this across all of Steam. Ask 10 people if they've heard of Prey Moon Crash. Maybe two of them say yes. Maybe one of them has played it, but probably not. Anyway, here's the conclusion to my Prey Moon Crash review from back in 2018. I really do believe that Prey Moon Crash is an evolution of the immersive sim genre. If you play Deus Ex and play Dishonored and then play Prey 2017, so not Moon Crash, you'll see the similarities that exist between them. In terms of their core gameplay loops, they are very similar games, but for their settings. Moon Crash isn't like that. It's a fundamentally different experience and it's a smarter experience by every metric. It doesn't have the world building punch or the storytelling chops that this genre is known for, but it is in my view, the smartest, best designed and most intellectually stimulating immersive sim I've ever played. And I would be stunned if Arcane Studios do not take many of the elements of this formula that they've created here and use them in future titles. If this was released as a standalone game from Arcane before Prey 2017 was released, you know, it was just dropped in our laps all of a sudden and we got to experience it with fresh eyes. This would no doubt be a game of the year contender and everyone would be losing their shit over it. It is absolutely on my game of the year list for 2018 and it's been a damn good year. That's a lot of gushing praise for a DLC. So why am I showing it to you now? Well, allow me to briefly introduce you to Prey Moon Crash. You play as a hacker aboard a space station orbiting a moon. The hacker is able to boot up a simulation which recreates the events of the moon base's destruction. At first you control one character, but as you progress and unlock more information, you'll unlock up to five characters, each of them their own class with a unique suite of stats and abilities. As you spend time in the simulation, the moon base changes. New paths become available and new enemies appear where before there were none. As time progresses, the simulation also becomes increasingly unstable until it eventually collapses. When that happens, or when all of your characters die, the simulation resets, so you have to do it all over again. You will continue in this simulation loop, learning and experimenting and progressing and dying as you make your way towards the final objective. Evacuating all five characters in a single flawless simulation run. Does that sound familiar? Prey Moon Crash wasn't just a good game. It was an evolution for immersive sims, incorporating both roguelike and time loop elements in a genre that was already built on experimentation, emergent gameplay, and non-static problem solving. For me, playing through Prey Moon Crash was somewhat akin to playing through Breath of the Wild for the first time and thinking, ah, yes, this is where the genre will go next. So in the lead up to Deathloop, everyone was like, oh, what is it? It's so confusing. I wonder what this will be, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, it's not confusing. I know exactly what this is going to be. It's going to be Prey Moon Crash, but like set in the 60s or whatever. Nothing about it seemed remotely mysterious to me because I'd already played Deathloop's warm up round, Prey Moon Crash. And given what a stroke of inspiration Moon Crash was, I was very, very excited to see Arcane apply the same design philosophy to a standalone experience. Deathloop's critical reception was spectacular. I mean, this is one of the most critically acclaimed titles of the year, sitting at 88% on Open Critic, and it was a Game of the Year nominee at the Game Awards. IGN declared it a masterpiece. GameSpot awarded it a rare 10 out of 10. Firm handshakes all round. I was really glad to see this for two reasons. Number one, I hadn't played Deathloop yet, and the reviews all but confirmed for me that Arcane had done it again and I was in for a good time. Secondly, I was glad to see Arcane get the day one recognition they deserve. Arcane games are niche, and while Dishonored had this amazing reception, Dishonored 2 didn't cut through in quite the same way, and Prey was just really overlooked and really underrated. Even the base game undersold, and it took everyone a few years to realize just what an absolute masterpiece Prey was. I mean, just for comparison's sake, IGN gave Prey 4 out of 10 first because they had a save file bug, okay? And then they re-reviewed it, gave it 8 out of 10. GameSpot gave it a 6. That's just fucking wild. Anyway, so I was glad to see Deathloop was getting these nods because I really love Arcane, and it was nice to see them getting this well-deserved moment of recognition. But at the same time, I did hear the rumblings deep in the bowels of the internet. There were whispers that maybe, possibly, perhaps, Deathloop wasn't Arcane's best work, and that many of these scores were a little on the high side. 
The sentiment has come through pretty clearly at this point, and if you're at all hooked into games social media, then you've no doubt heard it. So I walked into Deathloop thinking, okay, I'm definitely going to enjoy myself. Maybe it's not going to be a 10 out of 10 experience for me, but I'm surely in for a great ride. That's really not where I landed with Deathloop. I do not like this game at all. I, I, I actually don't think it's good and I don't recommend it, which is something I never would have anticipated saying at the start of this review process. I think about how far away I am from the general consensus on this, and I wonder if the reason I dislike it so much is because I've played a far better version of it from the same studio. Deathloop is this mangled, contorted, confused imitation of Mooncrash. It's like Prey Mooncrash had already perfected what this thing should be, and then Deathloop kind of felt the need to change it up to differentiate itself, and in so doing, it completely lost its balance. It's so much more disjointed, so needlessly complex, so burdened by competing systems, that the whole thing feels like a mess, and it really does. Like, that's the word I think of most when I think of Deathloop. A mess. In a way, I'm not surprised by this, because when I reviewed Mooncrash, the number one thing I admired about it was how remarkably complex its construction was, and yet it all somehow still managed to hang together. I kept thinking to myself that between the roguelike elements, the evolving level design, the time loop elements, the progression, the class design, and the scaling difficulty modifier, that if any part of this was busted, then the whole thing would just collapse in a heap. That never happened in Prey Mooncrash, but in my view, it definitely happened in Deathloop. Deathloop is an immersive sim that engenders more repetition than it does experimentation. Deathloop is an action game with one enemy type. Deathloop is a time loop game where time doesn't move except during loading screens and where you as a player have no meaningful connection to time. It's a puzzle game with only one solution and it's a mystery with no satisfying resolution. Deathloop is not Arkane's best game. It's not even their best time loop game. And yeah, unfortunately I just, I don't think this is good. Already? Deathloop begins here, straddled by Juliana as she plunges a knife into your chest repeatedly. You awaken on a beach thinking it was all some kind of messed up dream when you begin to notice words superimposed on your surroundings, giving you all sorts of helpful advice. It's immediately clear that this is a sort of inner monologue guiding you, and that inner has seen a few more things than you can presently recall in your adult state. It's here that you and Juliana begin your fucked up, filthy courtship as she taunts you to remember things that you just can't remember. Eventually, things become clearer when Juliana kills you, again, and you again awaken on that beach. The reality of the situation sets in. You're stuck in some sort of hellish time loop, and since the floating words tell you to break the loop, I guess you gotta break the loop. Deathloop's opening chapter has received criticism for being overly complex, too laboured with tutorials and menus and terminologies and indexes and quest logs and all the rest. It's argued that this arduous intro is a necessary evil to explain Deathloop's complex world and rule set, but that it eventually gives way to a more intuitive experience. I don't agree. I think all of this awkward complexity is the perfect primer for what awaits you in the rest of the game. The beating heart of Deathloop isn't its levels or its gameplay, it's this menu. This is where you'll return dozens of times. Choose where to go, choose who to hunt, highlight quests so you can spin the sundial to get the corresponding level to light up with the right map marker, so you can load in, run to an objective, collect your new passcode, and then run back to the safety of this menu. It's here that you'll spend time awkwardly sorting through duplicate trinkets and weapons and trying to discern which ones you've already equipped versus which ones you still need to infuse versus which ones you might need to infuse three of because all of your weapons need fast reloading, etc, etc. None of these individual things are complicated in and of themselves, but I look at Deathloop and I see an experience that is so gamey, and one that struggles to create a sense of immersion because it never tries to solve any of its design challenges through immersive gameplay-based solutions. It relies on this menu to do all of that heavy lifting. Imagine a singular connected world that you could move through, uninterrupted from end to end. Nope, there's a menu and you choose which level to load. Imagine time flowing as you played. Nope, time stands completely still whenever you play the game, and if you want to advance time, you do it through this menu. Imagine being able to change abilities or character trinkets or weapon mods during gameplay. Nope, you come back to this menu and you do all of that here. Imagine being able to logically intuit the solutions to the game's puzzles. 
No, they are not logic-based solutions that a player could organically arrive at through deduction and experimentation, so the only way to progress the player is to pile the solution into this menu and then give the player map markers to head towards. Arcane are the undisputed masters of the immersive sim genre, and ironically enough, Deathloop is one of the least immersive games I played this year, because it's never trying to be immersive. There's this serious lack of kinesthetic link between player and world, or to the outcomes that you as a player affect. I never felt like Black Reef was a real place. Beginning any foray into it felt like booting up a custom match in Halo where I would select the map and I would pick and ban abilities and weapons and attachments and I would set the game mode objectives and then I would hit the launch button. That was a feeling I just couldn't get past, and given how cutting edge Arcane have been since their inception, this reliance on a menu to drive forward so many of the game's core features felt like a big regression. Already I'm sure that at least some of you are thinking that it's unfair to label Deathloop an immersive sim because it's not trying to be that, and I agree. Deathloop is defined in large part by its genre-bending nature, combining the sandbox and level design of an immersive sim with the encounter design of an action game, all bound up in a time loop mystery wrapper. I don't think Deathloop successfully delivers on the goals of any of those genres, and no more is that evident than on the action side of the game. Judged as an action game, Deathloop fails because it has one enemy type, and that one enemy type is spectacularly stupid, and no, it did not need to be this way. You probably think I'm exaggerating when I say that there's only one enemy type in Deathloop, but I am not. They are all human. None of them have any abilities except for a sidesteppy juke thing. They all carry different weapons, but their capabilities are all identical, as is their AI behavior. I really cannot believe how dumb these enemies are. They are lemmings. They will run directly at you in a straight line, and that is all they got. Man, like... Really, really early on, I discovered just how dumb this AI is and how easily exploited they are. This here is a really heavily populated bunker teeming with enemies. I first saw this and I was like, uh oh, watch out, this place looks dangerous. Anyway, I tried to be stealthy at first, but then I made a mistake. So I had to fall back through this corridor. And what I realized is that all of the enemies will just run through that corridor. So I could just stand there and kill them all as they did so. So that's what I did. And this strategy is applicable to every moment and every square inch of this entire game. Since enemies do not have the power to shut down my abilities or stop my weapons from working, since they don't have the ability to displace or paralyze me, since they all have the same health, AI behavior and capabilities, you can just make some noise, stand in a doorway and mow them all down with a shotgun. That strategy works 100% of the time. Here's what makes this even worse. While I was going through this moment of realization outside this heavily guarded compound, I noticed an ammo vending machine next to me. It, it, it literally just distributes unlimited ammunition. So not only was I exploiting this singular enemy design and this brain dead AI, but I was also able to do it forever because I was being fed endless resources. Same goes for health. I legitimately don't care when I take damage in Deathloop because every level is flooded with health packs. I can't think of a game that offers more random health pickups per square inch than Deathloop. So I never care about taking damage because I know that so long as it's not fatal, I just look left or right and I'll find enough health kits to fully heal myself up. If you want to have enemy design as singular as this, or have them be as dumb as this, then at least limit my ammo and my health so I can't just stand there face tanking an entire garrison of enemies. That's, that's crazy. Deathloop does try to increase difficulty by making enemies more dangerous later, in that they can apparently spot you more easily, and they have stronger weapons, and they're also more numerous. In some of the later encounters, areas are just completely teeming with enemies. I think this was a really bad way to scale difficulty because ironically enough, it further disincentivizes me from trying to play stealthily or to lean into the game's immersive sim elements. This was certainly something I noticed early on. Because enemies are so numerous, I felt like I was going to get spotted most of the time anyway, and because I was so strong and I had unlimited resources, I didn't feel like it was worth the effort to try and play smart and avoid enemies. Enemies posed no threat to my progress, nor did they waste finite resources. 
resources, so killing them was fine. Dishonored solved this problem by being generally more difficult, but also with its world morality system, where killing things would warp the world around you. And Prey solved this problem by also being more difficult, and also carefully rationing resources so you literally couldn't kill everything. Deathloop never solves any of the problems that its laissez-faire combat design creates, so the easiest solution is just to kill everyone. Like the sign says, I guess. I have heard it said that it was necessary for this enemy design and this enemy AI to exist in this way because it is a time loop game, and if enemies posed a real threat then the entire experience would become frustrating. I flat out reject that. I think that sophisticated enemy design is essential to an experience like this because enemies should be full of weaknesses and behaviors that you could come to learn during loops, allowing you to exploit those vulnerabilities once you've identified them. One of the biggest letdowns of Deathloop is how incompatible its combat and progression model is with the promise inherent in a time loop game. Time loop games are ultimately Metroidvanias of the mind, where knowledge is power. In most time loop games, you don't become much more powerful in terms of your stats or your capabilities, but because you understand the world and your foes more deeply, you are in fact more powerful. Deathloop instead adopts a more traditional power-based progression model that undermines the need to learn or apply that learning. For some reason, there's a weapon rarity system that awards you absurdly powerful weapons that can mince entire rooms of enemies with ease each of which can be augmented with instant reloading, increased range, larger magazines, etc. I get all of these stat increases, so I have mountains of health and I can regen health faster. Combined with the unlimited health and ammo economy, it's pretty early on that you realize that you're essentially invulnerable, so you're never forced or even incentivized to learn. You can just brute force your way through everything. I'm sure that some people will respond by saying that I'm missing the point. You can do it this way, but you're meant to study and you're meant to learn and make use of the sandbox. That's the whole point of the game. Sure, but like, what is there to learn, really? You've got one enemy type. It's not like you're learning the weakness of dozens of different enemies and you switch between weapons and abilities to exploit those weaknesses in different ways. You can just stick them with the pointy end and it'll work every time. That's it. You want to know an action-focused time loop game that gets this right? Prey Moon Crash, but you're tired of hearing about this one. So how about Returnal? That was a game with a wide variety of enemies and tile sets, and very little in the way of meta progression. As you made progress in that game, you did so because you came to know the capabilities of each enemy so you could fight them better. You were always the same strength at the start of each new loop, so you had to rely on that knowledge to carry you. None of that exists here in Deathloop. You just get so strong so fast and you stay strong at the start of every loop so you can just run through and murder everything. I don't believe that Deathloop's balancing was designed in the context of the time loop, but I do believe it was purposefully neutered with a different goal in mind the invasion mechanic. At any point in time during your playthrough, you can be invaded by either an AI or a player-controlled Juliana. When this happens, the exits are sealed and they can only be opened by hacking an antenna. Juliana is also on the prowl and once uses a game of cat and mouse, or cat and cat, since both of you are fairly evenly matched in your capabilities, so getting the upper hand is very much about retaining the element of surprise. I've been pretty hard on Deathloop and I have a lot more to say, but I do think this invasion stuff is pretty good in some aspects. Certainly, at first, these invasions are a huge shot of adrenaline, especially considering that nothing else in the game poses any real threat to you. Juliana is the only force capable of meeting the player's might. So when she loads in, you immediately switch gears from relaxed exploration or mindless carnage to a sort of cowering paranoia. What I learned during invasions is that enemies are not challenging and that you can kill them all really easily and there's no reason not to do that except during an invasion. At that point, every enemy becomes a sound trap. The risk of engaging them is not them killing you, but rather them alerting Juliana to your location. This very much reminded me of Hunt Showdown, where the PvE enemies are basically fodder, but the noise you make while fighting them attracts the real threat other players. So this part of Deathloop really works. I, I just think it's kind of underbaked and its implementation really clashes with the rest of the game's design. In terms of it being underbaked, the idea of an immersive sim format being the staging ground for PvP encounters is really interesting. The level design is the perfect host for that and the suite of abilities at your disposal could make for plenty of unique 1v1s that go beyond simply shooting each other with a gun until one of you is dead. Sadly though, that's basically what most of the invasions end up being. Just you shooting at each other while you 
you teleport around with shift or you tank damage with that stupid havoc ability that just makes you basically invincible. It would be interesting if the level design was full of activatable traps or floors that drop out beneath you or oil slicks that could be set on fire or electrical fencing or whatever. Just stuff that you as a player could use to outplay or dispatch your foe. One of the broader limitations of Deathloop's level design is how static it all is. It can't really be manipulated to your advantage. So here in these invasions, most of the time you're just shooting at each other. More broadly, I feel like these invasions become a frustrating disruption toward the end of the game when you've already seen every level 15 times and you've been invaded 25 times and you just want to make some progress in the mystery, complete some objectives, take some time to listen to some audio logs or read some files lying around. When Juliana would invade me late game, I was like, ugh, not again which is not the intended response, right? This is an irreconcilable tension between the PvP invasion goals and the narrative mystery goals, and there surely would have been some way to reconcile it, but Arcane did not make any attempt to do that. I do wonder what it would have been like to have had the PvP element slightly more partitioned from the core experience. I imagine specific maps where Juliana could not invade, populated with more challenging enemies, and where the larger narrative reveals could unfold free from interruption. Perhaps these invasion areas might have more environmental traps and features that would encourage players to rely more on the sandbox than their guns. Splitting the game out like this would allow you to isolate what makes each of these distinct experiences interesting, and then design around those things to really make them sing. Overlapping like this, the way they currently do, it's definitely unique and it can certainly produce some interesting moments, but I think the entire game is just so compromised because so many of its design goals directly clash with other design goals. When I played Mooncrash, I was like, yes, these roguelike elements, these time loop elements, Arcane needs to stick with this stuff. I could immediately see how well all of these fit with the immersive sim genre and what could be done with them. I think the same thing goes for this invasion stuff here in Deathloop, only where Prey Moon Crash kind of perfected its roguelike and time loop elements, Deathloop provides a real rough first draft view of what's possible with invasion style mechanics in immersive sim. I hope Arcane stick with these ideas because they have a lot of potential, but right now I think they're just really messy. This is So I want to talk about Deathloop's time stuff. If you've watched me for a while, you'd know that I'm a huge fan of time loop games, Majora's Mask, Sexy Brutal, Returnal. I quite enjoyed the recent Forgotten City. I loved Prey Moon Crash and Outer Wilds is... Yeah, Outer Wilds is pretty much the greatest video game ever made, but that's a whole other video. So I like time loop games a lot. I have a lot of thoughts on what makes them tick, no pun intended. For me, the thing I love most about time loop games is that thing I mentioned earlier, about how they make the player more powerful through knowledge rather than through stats or keys or whatever. I was already a little let down by how little premium death loop places on this knowledge factor during combat because there isn't really much to learn. More profoundly, I think the death loop fails to establish a meaningful relationship between player and time. Death loop is about causality, cause and effect. It's not about time. So what the fuck does that mean? In a time loop game, time flows. The moon will hit Termina in Majora's Mask. The golden rule will be broken in the Forgotten City. The henchman will burst through the door in 12 minutes. The universe will end in Outer Wilds. From the moment each new loop begins in those games, the clock is ticking and I am constantly reminded of the threat that time poses. And so there is this urgency to all of my actions. I don't have time to waste because time is the most precious resource I have and every minute of those games is elevated by that urgency. Here in Deathloop, time does not flow when you are playing. Playing. Time stands completely still when I load into a mission, so there's never any urgency to anything. The one exception to this is if you get spotted in one of the locations, they'll actually blow up the entire island unless you disarm the reactor first. That is cool. I like that a lot. But that is the only time in this entire game where I'm cognizant of the seconds ticking past. The rest of the time, I have all the time in the world. Any time loop game where I do not need to think about time is, I think, missing an important beat. That lack of urgency is only one of the problems I have with the way Deathloop builds a relationship with time. I imagine that playing this would be very much about learning the secrets that each tick of the clock holds. I imagine this ever-moving clockwork universe where each of the targets would be in specific places at specific moments doing specific things, and I would need to learn those patterns and make these timely interventions to steer them toward each other so that I could strike my final blow and end the loop once and for all. 
but it's not like that. Each of Deathloop's four levels aren't clockwork universes, they're essentially just postcards frozen in time. I step into them and it isn't about understanding the flow and rhythm of these spaces because nothing moves. All the pieces are set in place before I arrive, and then I just move between them all as they stand perfectly still. That sucks. Imagine how much more interesting each level would have been if it had dynamic events that opened small windows of opportunity. Imagine a storm coming in from the harbour that would force enemies to relocate. Imagine a fight breaks out between two guards which causes other guards to break it up and gives me a moment to slip past unnoticed. Imagine like a crane lifting a heavy object that always falls at a precise moment and instead of shooting the visionary target, my goal was to gently, subtly steer this target towards that exact spot at that exact moment. Wouldn't that be more fun than just shooting them all in the face with a shotgun after doing a bunch of random bullshit earlier in the day? When time does progress in Deathloop, its impacts are very minor. When I learned that time could only be progressed through the menu, I'd assumed that it would be because levels would undergo vast changes, especially considering that there's only four levels. That is not the case. Levels can get a fresh coat of paint in the form of snow, which can also freeze water, making some new pathways accessible. But yeah, most of the changes are aesthetic and they change up some enemy locations and that's about it. The biggest change that's felt is that some door that's typically locked becomes unlocked during a certain time of the day and you never get to see the mysterious process of who opens it because all of the changes that take place happen while you're on the loading screen. This is what I meant earlier about how you as a player don't have a relationship with time. There is no urgency, you don't need to be aware of the flow of time as you play, time does not present you specific moments of opportunity, and the events inherent in time's passage are all obscured from you. So without that relationship to time, you instead have a relationship with causality, cause and effect. But it's a very tenuous and unsatisfying relationship. I sabotage some fireworks in the morning and later that day, someone dies. I can't see them dying, I don't think I can at least, but I hear it. I sabotage a scientific experiment at noon and then a dude goes to a party that night. Uh, I don't get to see him realize that his experiment has been botched, but it happens because he then changes his plans. I organize a voice recording of a party invite and I don't get to see it delivered, but apparently it is delivered and then some other person also goes to the party as well. I stop a workshop from blowing up in the morning so that a passcode is accessible in the afternoon. I don't get to see the moment when the workshop might have blown up. I just turn off a machine, I go back to my menu cave, I advance time, and then I come back to see that everything is fine and the password has been delivered to a computer terminal. It's very frustrating to never see the effects of my actions in motion to only ever see their outcomes. Picture a Rube Goldberg machine where actions have consequences and you can see that and it's actually really satisfying to see all that in motion. Deathloop is literally a Rube Goldberg machine where you never get to see any of this. You see the first move, and then you see this learning screen, and then you see the dinner plate. That's it. By the way, I know I'm laying it on really thick here, I get it. I'm not blind to the fact that this has just been like 25 minutes of me rallying on this game, but this is what I think, so I'm just gonna continue. Puzzles. The puzzles in Deathloop are terrible. I think they're the worst parts of the entire game. There's essentially no puzzle solving or deduction in Deathloop because all of the steps involved are so convoluted and counterintuitive that the only way that a player could reasonably solve them is to have the exact solution spelled out for them in a menu and then they just lead the player by the nose with map markers. Most of the steps in Deathloop's mystery are just collecting some passcode to a safe or some keywords spread out across three locations or some pictures spray painted onto a wall which are basically the same as passcodes to some sealed off area. The entire game is just collecting keys. I would have killed for some sort of physics based immersive sim style problem solving where I had to manipulate the environment in some way. I would have killed for some time loop based puzzles where I was asked to do certain things at certain moments. I would have killed for any kind of puzzle where I could have deduced what the next step might be. Deathloop doesn't do that. It says, here's what you need to do now, and then you do it, and then it says, okay, cool, here's what you need to do next. I found that so fucking boring. I really did. All of this culminates in this shockingly disappointing ending from both a design and narrative perspective. So there's only one solution to Deathloop's puzzle. One, there is one order in which you need to kill these targets and generally only one way to kill them. I mean, most games only have one solution, but this one feels like it should have more, right? Is that an unfair expectation? Maybe? But like, why couldn't we have clustered different visionaries together in different ways at different times, each of the kills posing new challenges or unlocking new opportunities? 
That's what Prey Moon Crash did. You could evacuate each character in any order you liked, by any means you liked, and the decisions you made made subsequent escapes easier or harder. Genius. Why not carry that over to Deathloop? And the narrative at the end, man, like talk about dropping off a cliff. The ending or endings provide so little resolution to the mystery of Black Reef. They are over in a flash and I was just really bummed out by them. I really struggled to connect with Deathloop storytelling in general. Outside of Colt and Juliana, all of the visionaries seemed to be as one note as the rest of the game. They all had crazy, egotistical, psychopath energy, and they were also frenetic in their disposition and delivery. I found reading pieces of paper laying on the desk or audio logs to be a pretty poor storytelling mechanism. I worked harder than I would have liked to have kept up with this story, and I would have liked the ending to have made all that work worthwhile. It definitely, definitely does not. Okay, so I should probably finish by talking about this review itself, because like I mentioned earlier, I know how this sounds, right? It's 30 minutes of me just hammering this game, very little in the way of praise. You might ask, like, where's the balance here? You're making Deathloop sound like it's the worst game in the world. I mean, I could list for you some pros, like Deathloop has great art design and its soundtrack is cool. And the performance of Colt and Juliana are some of the best performances in any video game this year. Even if listening to them the second time round would be really difficult because the stuff you learn would make that really hard. Trust me, you'll know when you play it for yourself. There are things that I liked about Deathloop, but I don't think the purpose of a review is to give you a list of pros and cons. It's to tell you what I think and explain why I think it. If I was somewhere in the middle on this, I probably would give you a list of pros and cons and explain why I'm conflicted in my views on this overall experience. But I'm not in the middle on this. I dislike it a lot. And the few things I do appreciate about Deathloop don't change my overall view of this game. That's okay, by the way. This game is one of the most critically acclaimed games of the year. It's a Game of the Year nominee. It won Best Art Direction and Best Game Direction at the Game Awards. And nothing I say will change any of that. This game sits at 86% very positive on Steam. Ask 10 people if they like Deathloop, and nearly nine of them will say that they like it. So if you're weighing up a purchase decision about Deathloop, then don't listen to me, you should probably trust those nine people, okay? But I am the other guy, I'm number 10. I think that Deathloop is really messy. I think it does not deliver on the promise of an immersive sim or an action game or a time loop game or a narrative driven mystery game. And it's genre blending experiment is in my view, a failure. I think that this really pales in comparison to Arkane's previous work, especially Prey Moon Crash. Which, honestly, if you've played Deathloop and you liked it, you should go and play Prey Moon Crash, because it's better by almost every metric. It walks the dangerous high wire and keeps its balance, where Deathloop just falls and falls and falls. I do not recommend Deathloop. One last thing before we go, thanks to NVIDIA and MSI, I also had the chance to play Deathloop on the new MSI GE76 laptop. This laptop is truly next gen because it has the latest 30 series GPU built in, meaning you get all the benefits of the latest GPU hardware in portable form. What are those benefits you ask? Well, obviously the raw processing power of NVIDIA's 30 series cards is unmatched, delivering you the best frame rates and resolutions on the market today. In addition to that, you also get ray tracing, which is a technique that simulates light using an algorithm, resulting in the most realistic rendition of light we've ever seen in video games. The most impressive tech is one utilized in Deathloop, and it's called DLSS, which stands for Deep Learning Super Sampling. What it does is it renders your game at a lower resolution while making it look like it's rendering it at a higher resolution, giving your GPU more headroom to spend on higher graphical settings and frame rates. DLSS provides a noticeable performance improvement here in Deathloop, providing higher average frame rates than when I have it disabled, and also increasing overall frame stability as well. Pair that with the laptop's 300 hertz refresh rate on its screen and you'll get a silky smooth experience even when the action is thickest. In addition to its sleek design, each GE76 utilizes Nvidia's Optimus technology which significantly improves battery life. And there's the option to overclock the GPU using MSI's intuitive software, allowing you to squeeze every bit of performance out of your hardware. Gaming laptops aren't the giant bricks they used to be. They're smaller, thinner, lighter and more portable than ever before, but they're just as versatile 
versatile. You may want to use a laptop as your main driver, plugging it into your monitors as you would a desktop PC, or even better, you can plug it into a TV, allowing you to enjoy your games on big screens and with surround sound setups. To learn more about Nvidia's next gen GPUs or the MSI GE76 laptop, click the links in the description below. Thanks Nvidia and MSI for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.